let's just cut to the chase. Let's go right where all the, the best analysis we can get in this country. What is the very best analysis available at any price? They said, well, Dave, that would be neutron activation. I said, okay, neutron activation it is. Where do we get it done? Well, you have to go to a government lab to get neutron activation, you know. So I find that most of the labs of the U.S. were all tied up for like a year and a half, two years in advance. So we found out that Harwell Labs over in London would do the analysis for us. So what we did is we burned our sample for 69 seconds, and just one second before it should start reading these elements, we turned it off. We take our knife and we dig out the carbon electrode, this little glowing white bead now that's on black because it's cooled off. We dig it out, we put it in a bag, and we send it off to Harwell Laboratories. Now, we assume that this is going to some place where they do nuclear analysis. This has nothing to do with electrons way out on the outside. It has to do with the nucleus itself, the protons and the neutrons of the nucleus. And these guys send the energy into the nucleus, and they read the resonant spectra of the nucleus itself. Now, this is absolutely certain to read this stuff, right? So we get a report back, and it says, no precious elements detected. Now, now this, is, this just really, really frustrates everybody. We say, my God, are we literally making these elements under this DC arc? Or is it that they exist in some other state that we don't know about? Now, the concept of having a change in the nuclear state never entered our minds. You know, it has to be something in the electron structure. And yet, the nucleus doesn't read. And I decided, you know, enough of the spectroscopy. I know how much is here now. We've actually done quantitative analysis. Our analysis said that the material that we're starting with had 6 to 8 ounces per ton of palladium, 12 to 13 ounces per ton of platinum, 150 ounces per ton of osmium, 250 ounces per ton of ruthenium, 600 ounces per ton of iridium, and 1,200 ounces per ton of rhodium. Now, to give you some idea of what this means, the best known deposit in the world is now being mined in South Africa, where they go a half mile under the ground and they follow an 18-inch seam of rock, and they bring out this rock that contains one-third of one ounce per ton of all the platinum elements. And our material contains an excess of 2,400 ounces per ton of the platinum group elements. And so, needless to say, the numbers are so preposterous, so absolutely ridiculous, that I said, you know, we got to pursue this further. we got to find out where it takes us. If it was 10 or 15 or 20 ounces per ton, I might have walked away from it. If it was two or three hundred ounces a ton, I might have considered walking away from it. But this is 7,500 times better than the best known deposit of the world. You know, we've got to find out what this is all about. So I went to this PhD analytical chemist that everybody said, if you can get this guy to do the work, he's the only certified expert witness in metallurgical separation in the, in the state of Arizona. Now, this guy is the best you can buy. He's a PhD analytical chemist trained at Iowa State University which is where the Department of Energy's Metallurgical School is. So I went to this guy and I said, here's the Soviet text. In here it says, this is how to do quantitative chemical separation. Would you run the procedure for me? And he looked over my book. He looked over the references. I told him about my spectroscopic studies and showed them references in the book. And he said, Dave, I've heard this story all of my life about these precious elements, particularly the platinum group here in Arizona. You must understand, I'm a certified expert witness, and the only thing I have to sell is my credentials. If I charge you money, then I have to write you reports. And he says, I'm not comfortable doing that. So he said, but I'll tell you what I'll do. I will work for you at no charge at all until I can show you where you're wrong. And at that point, I'll sign a report and give it to you, and you pay me then $60 an hour for my time. I went, gee, you know, sounds fair enough to me. And so uh, I started working with this guy, and he actually ran all the Bureau standards, weights and measures procedures. He ran the, the Soviet procedures. He actually bought standards and ran them in the procedures. Anyway, three years later, <laughs> my bill was about $138,000, and he was kind of needing some money. <laughs> 
And he says, Dave, I can tell you it's not any of the other elements on the periodic table. <laughs> and, and I said, no, John, that's not enough. You've got to tell me what it is. And he says, well, when I put commercial standards in or run it through the procedure, it separates where it's supposed to separate. But when I put your stuff in run it through the procedure, it separates just like it's supposed to. Except, when I'm done, I've got 6 to 8 ounces of ton of palladium, 12 to 13 ounces of ton of platinum, 150 ounces of ton of osmium, 250 ounces per ton of ruthenium, 600 ounces per ton of iridium, and 1,200 ounces per ton of rhodium. And I said, well, what's the problem? I mean, what, what, it says this is exactly the same numbers as Spectroscope was telling us from another laboratory. And he says, well, Dave, when we take an element that's so conspicuous like rhodium, see the color of this uh, sweatshirt she's wearing right here? That's the color of rhodium chloride solution. It's a very unusual color. Thank you. <laughs> rhodium got its name from the rose color of its chloride solution. It's a very unusual, very distinct color. It's a rose color. And so there's no other chemistry of anything other than possibly some shades of, of chromium are similar to this, but it's a very unusual color. You don't find it any place else. And there was no chromium in our ore. So anyway, he says, when I separate rhodium as pure rhodium, it looks just like that color. It's a gorgeous, you know, rose color. But when I neutralize the rhodium solution and it precipitates out of solution as a hydroxide and I dry that at 850 degrees in a controlled atmosphere under oxygen, it forms an anhydrous dioxide. And it's red-brown, the very color it should be to be rhodium dioxide. And then I hydrogen reduce it and the oxide leaves and it's a gray-white powder, just like rhodium should be. But then I anneal it to 1400 degrees and it turns snow white. And he says, Dave, I have no idea what this white stuff is. So I said, okay, what's the problem? And he says, well, at this point, in my formal education as a PhD chemist, I'm supposed to take these samples and send them for spectroscopic confirmation. And I said, well, it's pure rhodium. Let's send it for confirmation. He said, well, when I send the dioxide, they tell me it's iron. And he says, Dave, I know that this is not iron. You know, iron's a very common element. We work with it all the time. This is not iron. And I said, well, then what does the material after you hydrogen reduce it read to be? And he says, well, it automatically quits being iron, and now it's silicon aluminum. <laughs> and I said, well, what's the white stuff? And he says, well, that's calcium and silica. So our iron that had no silica, no calcium, no aluminum, now becomes silicon aluminum, and now there's no iron just by putting hydrogen gas on it. And he says, Dave, my life was so simple before I met you. <laughs> now, needless to say, this is taking years and years and years of work. Uh, I finally got involved with a Canadian partner who came in in 1986, and they put up some money and said, we will monitor the work you're doing, and when we're totally comfortable, that what you're representing, in fact, is so, then we'll put up the money to build your, your production facility, which I wanted to build after the studies were done. And so I said, look, we're going to use General Electric. General Electric actually has people back there who are building fuel cells out of rhodium and iridium. And they've actually bought rhodium and iridium to work with. They know the chemistries of it. So I said, we're going to take our stuff to them and have them do the evaluations of our rhodium and our iridium. And they said, good, we'll be your financial backer. We are backed by Legal and General Assurance in London, a $26 billion a year mutual fund. I said, okay, this, this looks like a real good arrangement. Everybody signed confidentiality agreements. Nobody could talk about it, and we just did our studies. But when we got back to GE, I talked with them, and they had told me, yeah, we did the fuel cells, and yeah, we know that the stuff doesn't analyze, and yeah, we know it explodes. I said, you've seen it? They said, yeah, we've seen it. It explodes. I said, but it doesn't analyze. They said, well, when we get our stuff from Johnson Matthey, our rhodium and our iridium, it doesn't work well in fuel cells. So we put it into molten salt. 